Consciousness is still an apparent mystery. Maybe the brain is a kind of computer and the mind is the software that runs on it. What we're trying to explain are people's experiences. And experiences are, by definition, private. However much I know about somebody else's brain, I can't have their experiences. So the data are private, but that doesn't mean that one can't do good science. I guess I was always interested in, in consciousness and in the brain, but it wasn't really clear when I was starting out that I would be a neuroscientist, because there are many ways you can, you can study the brain, you can think about consciousness. There's philosophy, there's maths, there's physics. And in fact, one of the, the things that, that I've noticed that indeed really tried to cultivate over my career since then is a very interdisciplinary approach. Hi, Anil. Hello. June, nice to meet you. Seth. Yeah. Welcome to the beautiful Sussex countryside. And you're, so you're a physicist? Yes, yes. I'm a physicist. I build instrumentations. That's why I'm, I'm curious about how you interface with the brain. How do you map the brain? Uh, we have a very interdisciplinary lab. In our lab, we do, we've got physicists, but then we have people doing brain imaging, okay. um, using functional magnetic resonance imaging and, and EEG. And then we have a, a virtual reality lab too as well. So we use emerging VR techniques to manipulate people's experience of the world and, and of themselves. In my lab, we've got all sorts of people working together to get at this problem, this basic problem of how consciousness happens. I think it would be very interesting to yeah, see what, you, what yeah. you think of this. Hallucinations are a fantastic window into conscious perception because there is no such thing as normal perception. You know, we're hallucinating all the time. It's just that whenever we agree about a hallucination, that's what we call reality. Okay. This is called the hallucination machine. <laughs> um, yeah, I can see people walking through the marketplace. So you can look all around, you can look up and down, look behind you, rotate on the chair. Yeah, just, just have a good look around you. Very lively campus. things going on. Great. S okay. Students are still walking around. Uh, oh, now it looks very strange. Uh, for a second, the student turned into animals. I see every student walking towards me have some sort of animal face, like a dog. So our perception of what's out there in the world has to be a kind of best guess and inference. When we hallucinate, that just reflects what happens when this process goes awry a little bit. But the, the important point is that the mechanisms that generate the seemingly false perception are exactly the same mechanisms as that generate what we think of as normal perception. So we can hear inside the living brain to see what's going on while people have different experiences. And this means that, to some extent, the problem is tractable, it's approachable, it's something we as scientists can look at. It doesn't mean we're going to have a eureka moment and come up with a single answer. So let's try to account for the properties of being conscious in terms of their underlying biological mechanisms. And let's see if after doing that, we still think that there is this fundamental explanatory mystery about why consciousness is part of our, our universe at all. So we're gonna explore a little bit with um, virtual reality here, perhaps. The more important part of our own personal experience is the experience of being me or of being you. So the brain is always having to work out where its body is and what is its body. The experience of being you is the experience of being and having the this body that you do. We're taking the, the video from the mannequin's head yeah. and feeding it into your, That's why. Into your okay. headset. Yes. So the, the idea here is we can try to make you experience okay that your self-location has shifted. 
why I feel disoriented and I was trying to figure out where my hands are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Exactly Your hands aren't where they, where they ought to be, right? right? Yeah. And we can make this illusion a bit stronger if, if we do a trick which is really like, powerful like. for the brain. Oh, that's weird. Because uh, <laughs> the mannequin's hand is moving even though my hand is moving. It feels really strange uh, because somebody is touching my hand and moving and yes, yet I can see mannequins. <laughs> <laughs> this is a generalization of what, what's been around for a long time, which is called the rubber hand illusion, where, okay. where you can convince the brain that a rubber hand is part of its body by doing exactly this kind of thing. And here we're taking it to a slightly more extreme level by trying to give you a whole different body. Mm -hmm. If you just remain still and, and just experience being the mannequin, we'll just do a little test here. I see the knife cutting into my, into my body. And how does <laughs> that feel? <laughs> it feels very real. I almost feel like the blood should come out. <laughs> it didn't. Can you shake your hand a bit? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so our experience of the world and of the self, they're both kinds of controlled hallucinations that are just reined in, just, just continually refined by sensory data. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of guesswork all the way down. Uh, this is a time perception experiment. So we're going to show Jun a series of videos of different kinds of scene. And, and what we're interested in is how long Jun will think the scene lasts. You know, what's his perceived duration of the scene? So he's going to watch the video and then be asked to report a number of seconds, how long he thought it lasted. And of course, while he's doing that, we are going to be recording what his brain is doing. Each individual video, just use the joystick to tell us how long you thought it lasted. Is, is that clear? Yes, that's clear. Once you can start to build maps between what's happening in brains and what people experience, or what they say they experience, you can begin to chip away at the problem. But the idea here is it's, it's a visual scene where perceptually not much is happening. Um, and what we're interested in is time that we experience related to how information in our perceptual scene changes over time. So there's, there's a, a very deep irony happening here where the builder of the world's most precise clock seems to have possibly the worst time perception in the world as well. So, so that's Yun's brain. So here we, we're looking at it through three different, um, three different planes. Did you think you were pretty accurate? I felt I was doing well. <laughs> we think you may not have done quite so well. Okay, that's um, good. At, that's least, good. So at least to start with, yeah. the first few videos, it seemed that I was way off. you were, looked like you were overestimating okay. quite, quite a lot. Um, which is interesting for somebody who's built the world's most accurate <laughs> clock. Um, maybe you need it. <laughs> We're going right to the top of this escarpment. This is one of the training sites where a few years ago I learned to, uh, learned to fly um, in a paragliding course. When you see the landscape like this, you feel like you can't help but wanting to jump into the sky. <laughs> I... There's one thing that made me think about paragliding in time. Right? So one of, one of the things about time perception that people always say is that when, you, when you're in a moment of high adrenaline, time seems to, to slow down. And this is something as neuroscientists we still don't really understand. You just need a little bit of breeze, enough to, to lift the wing up so it can get above your head. One of the things I'm interested in that we study is the experience of being a self. Ready? Let's go. Every time we move our eyes around or go from one room to another, our experience of the world changes. My experience of being me is partly defined by it being somehow continuous over time. And one of the, the lessons from, from neuroscience and from psychology and psychiatry about this is that this sense of self is a, a construction, it's another perception. And you can pull the different parts of being a self apart in different ways. So 
when you consider this and reflect on it, it means that my experience of being me becomes more full of wonder and more valuable because I can see how intricate, how fragile it is and how I shouldn't take it for granted even though it's so easy to do so because it's always there in the background. And that does change, I think, the way I go about my life and science has that potential to really transform the way we understand the world and ourselves.